is, I, I realize, a busy church like ours, busy things, things are happening all the time. There's a lot of needs that come up and you can't give to everything, and I understand that. That's why the, the candy thing is a dollar offering. And, because once a year, we do invite in an incredibly cool ministry that I'd love to see our, ch our church support. And so I'm going to ask you ahead of time, even now, just to be thinking about, I'd love for you to give it a generous way to the ministry that we're going to be having just represented here, and that is the Gideons. The Gideons, would you give a warm welcome to Dan as he comes? He is a representative of the Gideons. Thank you. Um, I just think it's great. You know, we have a literature distribution thing, much like the Gideons, in the Assemblies of God, but you don't know about it. Because I don't tell you about it. And we don't support it. Not that it's a bad thing. I just personally think that the Gideons crosses denominational lines in ways that uh, is phenomenal. They get in places that normally people can't get. They have been faithful for over a hundred years doing one thing. They don't preach. They get the Bible out. The Word of God. Isn't that incredibly cool? It really is. So cool. But Dan, you, you get the privilege, privilege or the opportunity or the just sheer panic opportunity to go in front of different churches and present the Gideons. And how long have you been a Gideon? About 10 years now. About 10 years now. Step up just a little closer here. Oh. Otherwise, these people over here can't see you. I want them to see your smiling face. Sure. Handsome man. Thanks. Sorry. Not good looking. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, so sorry. funny. And they're not here. There's an inside joke that they all know it. And you're just kind of like, oh, what did that mean? Um, it means you're ugly. <laughs> Don't take it personally. Every guy is. Okay, just so you know. Every guy is ugly. We, I've never seen a good-looking guy in my whole life. Have you? He's picking on me because I spoiled the shyest in my class. <laughs> so I go, boy. Okay, so you've been a Gideon for 10 years. And um, what does somebody got to do to be a Gideon? Be a godly man. Be a godly man. Be involved in church. Be committed to a church. Yeah. And be a uh, pastor's to recommend us guys. Okay, so, yeah. so if there's a guy out here that are wondering, hey, how can I be a Gideon? I need to support the Gideons. I'll tell you what, friends, like every organization, although he probably was going to put the plug in, um, they're always, Gideons, I know, is a great organization that really could always use more men uh, who are willing to be involved, support it, but also maybe be willing to even go to churches like Dan here and explain who the Gideons are and take an offering for the Word of God. So, But if you want to do that, you need to contact you, or the Gideons, or contact me so they can get my approval. Because yeah. I would approve almost every guy in here. <laughs> almost. Um, tell us, how many countries uh, is the Gideons involved with? We're currently in over 190 countries. Over 190 countries. Yeah. Wow. How much does the, the Bibles cost? How much can you know an offering provide? One of these just cost a dollar twenty-five, and it's, I don't think that's too little. One of the a, a girl, a high school girl in Albania, received one of these. She took it home, read it, and she gave her life to Jesus Christ. She, but she had four friends, so she carefully separated the four Gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And gave them to her four friends. They read it. They gave her their lives to Jesus. Five lives changed by one of these. Wow! So give her. That's phenomenal. Give her permission to tear these up. That's phenomenal. I mean, I just, I just can't believe that. Because we, we just take this so for granted, don't we? They don't have a lot of Bibles. They had, she had a Bible like this, and you say that she went through and the Gospels and separated the Gospels. Man, that's incredible. Use a knife. You get the Gospel of Matthew. Wow. That's just phenomenal. That's all you get, though. That's all you, you don't get a whole Bible. All you get it is... In, in distributions around the world. So, so, so I find Bibles have been torn up, but the interpreters will tell them, don't pick up the pages, because the wind will blow the pages. And then people pick up the pages and read them. So. You get Mark. God's Word does not, does not return void. <laughs> you keep talking, I'll keep tearing. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, I was full of the shyest in my class, so 
Gideon's has always been a challenging ministry for me. Not just public speaking, but no, just handing out Bibles to people. And I don't get, the Lord's been working on me on that. I've been involved in numerous distributions down the cities. I've been down the India Fest, down to down the state capital. That's, that was fun. I don't speak the language. I'm passing out Bibles in a different language, but get the full range of responses from thank you to no thanks to that's great, you know. <laughs> that's a growing experience. I highly recommend it. That's phenomenal. I just wrecked this one. I'll, I'll replace this one. That's fine. <laughs> um, and, and a few more. Sure. But the Gospels are gone. <clears throat> it's really interesting is I was handing it to the different individuals I handed it to. I got a sense from them, like, I have not cherished this the way I should. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> I didn't really think I was going to actually tear it up. <laughs> but I did. Um, the so big, we the big, for a giving guy. Yeah, I tell you what, you never know what's going to happen here. Uh, the bigger Bibles, you can buy one of those for $5. You can buy them in honor of. You can pick up cards. We have a, a thing, just so you know, the Gideon's ministry is always represented. You're just not aware of it. But if you are in honor of or a birthday, anniversary, you can fill out a card like this that we have in that circular area up in the lobby. And you can give a donation to the Gideon's and have a Bible placed in honor of or memory of. The cards are free. You can take them anytime you want can give as much as you want. Yeah, which is just absolutely fantastic. But I, I love the Gideon ministry. Um, Dan is a part of what's called in this area, it's from the St. Croix River over to who knows where, and from down south to where knows to who, yeah, it's, it's an area, okay? It's called the St. Croix Valley, the St. Croix Valley Camp uh, of Gideons. And uh, I have to admit, you guys together, uh, we have been the biggest supporting church in the St. Croix Valley camp uh, that they've had for years uh, because we really believe in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to take an offering right now and you're right, check out to Maranatha. Uh, that way your, your giving credit is easily recorded by Sandy and we're going to take the both services together, combine them and send off the Gideons with one check. If you're not prepared today, as Dan mentioned, the cards or in the future, you want to make a note on a check ever right out to Maranatha. If you say so much in the memo for Gideon's, we make sure it gets there. So, praise God. Are you ready to give? Praise God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your minister, your, the, your faithful ministers, Gideon's. Father, their, their wives that serve in the auxiliary, so many of them. Father, they've been faithful to the single task of getting and distributing your word. Father, we ask your continued blessing on the Gideon ministry. Father, upon this offering, the Bible is the literature that it is going to produce in the lives of the hands that it's going to fall into. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give Dan a good hand? Okay, while that offering is being taken, uh, Ron, Carlson, where are you? Where's Ron? Ron, come up here really quick. Tell us about, you know, we got all these things happening. Like I said, we're a large family. We have a lot of, we had six yards and we did leaves yesterday. We put a culvert in. And something else you just told me about this morning that's happening. Thank God I've got a nice blower so I didn't have to rake. The blower works good. Hey, we're having a, a little party today and I want to invite you guys. Um, right after church today, we're going to meet out in the lobby. We're going to go down to Goodview. And I believe it's... Uh, 262nd Street. We're going to go down, and uh, a very dear friend of mine and her mother, they need a hand cutting firewood. So I want to invite uh, you men and you ladies, if you want to participate, uh, to, to bend over and pick up logs to help us stack wood. It would be really appreciative. If you're interested, please contact me after service. Thanks. So you'll be out there for a couple hours this afternoon. Well, hopefully, we'll get it get done. done. Yeah, if we can get. 10, 20 guys, that would be great. We'd get it done real quick and uh, be home in time for dinner. Fantastic. So you're going to be in the lobby. Any questions, they can see you to be a part. Some of them are, might have to go home and change their clothes. You know, the clientele here suits and ties every Sunday. <laughs> God is good. All the time. Can we have more house lights on? I want, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to be able to... Oh, look. Wow, there's people in the house. Wow. How are you doing? You know, it's that whole lighting thing we got going on, so um, you get to pay attention with this much light going on. For those of you who are visiting, and 
for those of you who've been here, we are wrapping up this morning just a short three sermon series on Is Your Faith Growing? The challenging question I put before you is, is your faith growing? In the first part, we talked about the fact that your faith to grow is natural. It can't stay where you began, just as a baby in Christ. You receive Christ as your Savior, that's great. Please don't stay just in that state. And we looked at multiple scriptures that talk about faith growing. In fact, it started several weeks, a couple months ago, my devotions as I was reading 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15. He says, Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others, but this phrase right here, Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, and he goes on. But that phrase, as your faith continues to grow, really challenged me, stirred in me. It's like, yeah, it's really true. And I asked myself the question, started there, is my faith growing? Is your faith growing? So we talk about the fact that growth is to be expected. It has to happen. Last week, we talked about the consequences of not growing your faith. The consequences of not growing your faith. I said there's a lot of them, but I really emphasize two major ones. To me, they're the two biggest things that, that plague me or bug me or really concern me. Does anybody remember what the first one was? We're not pleasing to God. By not growing your faith, we're not pleasing to God. Please don't, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you any less. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. But this idea of being pleasing to Him, it's like this. I love my kids. It doesn't matter what they do. I'll visit them in jail. In fact, I have. I love them, whether they're good or bad. But I'm happier with them when they're good. I'm pleased with them when they're good. In John chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So proving to be my disciples. Bearing fruit, growing, being pleasing to God. Developing and growing in our faith. And the second consequence of not growing is... Lost opportunity, exactly. Wow, the second service is so much more awake than the first service. <laughs> Seriously, friends, I don't know about you, but I, I am personally mortified from time to time, and I think about opportunities I've missed. Times where I've been outright just disobedient, feeling the prompting of God and not being obedient. Lost opportunity. Friends, we will never know. Lost opportunity. By us not growing in our faith, Things come by and we're not ready for it. We haven't developed the kind of faith or that kind of obedience to God. We are lost opportunities. Tragically, the reality is most of those lost opportunities are for eternity. Lost opportunity. That's the consequence of not growing. So this week, what I want to do is spend the remainder of our time together talking about how to grow our faith. How does faith grow? If the Apostle Paul is talking about, he says, our hope is that in your faith continues to grow... Well, he wasn't just going, well, I, I hope it does. Good for you. There's, there's ways that faith can grow. I want to share with you four things, three of which I'm going to spend a lot of time on. One I'm just going to mention and get going, and it's foundational. I have to mention it because it really starts here. In order for faith to grow, it has to be intentional. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I mentioned this point fairly often. If you're visiting with us this morning, you need to kind of catch up a little quicker with us and just understand that I, I explain this. I talk about this idea of intentionality a lot. If you're going to grow, you have to make the decision to grow. Just showing up at church on Sunday, hoping that I'm going to grow and... Yeah, it's, it's one little ingredient to become a stronger Christian, but just because you show up here every week does not necessarily mean that you're going to grow. It means that you've had a wonderful God experience with the fellowship of the believers for an hour and a half, or two, or three, depending on how long he really goes. That's all it really means. If you are going to grow... You've got to make the determination, I want to grow. I want to develop my faith. I want to see my faith develop. I don't want to be the same a year from now that I am today. 
It's got to be intentional. You know, people with good marriage, they weren't lucky. They worked at it. They determined they were in a good marriage. If you want to be strong in faith, it's because you made a determination. I am not going to be just a casual Christian. I am going to take seriously following the Lord Jesus Christ and growing as a Christian. Okay, so that's foundational. I can preach the whole series on it because I have. But moving to the second way, the second ingredient, the second part of growing and developing our faith. How does faith grow? By hearing the Word of God. Friends, you can't get around it. Hearing the Word of God. Hearing the Word of God. And I'm not just talking about, you know, hearing it with these external ears. I mean, hearing the Word of God. I know a lot of people that sit and listen to Bible tapes all day long. It doesn't change their life one bit. In fact, tragically, oftentimes, they become almost more pharisaical because their knowledge has puffed them up. Hearing the Word of God. I mean, to really hear it. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Consequently, faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word about Christ. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. We really hear it. In Isaiah chapter 55, 10, verse 10, 11, it talks about God's Word being powerful. It is going to be sent out. It will accomplish that for which it was sent. Out. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Friends, the word of God, you will not grow and develop faith until you start reading the Bible. The word of God tells us stories about some of the men and women of the past. And their difficulties, their obedience with God and what did what happened. Guess what? You read that, it teaches you, instructs you in faith, but it also encourages and fans faith in the, in, the, in the flame. You read these stories and it ignites something in your heart that you believe that God would actually probably do the same thing today if somebody was willing to trust Him. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. It is so important. You have heard me say so many times, friends, you don't need me. You don't. I know a lot of you like to come and you like to sit and listen. You're very complimentary. Pastor Mike, I like to listen to you preach. I like your sermon. I like, guess what? You don't need me. You cannot make it without this. You cannot. You have got to be men and women of the book. Friends, you've got to find times in your schedules where you pick up a little bit and you say, well, Pastor Mike, I don't understand it. I read parts I don't understand too. I still read it. I still keep at it. Guess what? Over the years, I got to know more and more and more. I have people tell me every once in a while, Pastor Mike, I can't believe all the Bible scriptures you know. You're like a walking concordance. You know something? I didn't wake up one day saying, I want to memorize scripture. And force it to happen. This happened? Man, over 40 years of reading the word, 40 years you go over and over and over and you hear it and it reflects it and say, God, I remember this. I think it's over here on this page over here. Oh, I remember Paul and Paul encouraging Timothy about that over here. And then Philemon, oh, yeah, that's right. And, and you know something? You do it long enough and it becomes part of you. You are what you eat. Amen? You know, let me just tell you, I think I've mentioned this in the past, but you know, when you walk in a, in a church building, and you don't know what kind of church it is, I can give you a really good indication to help you understand for you to be able to tell what kind of church you're in. Okay? If you walk in a church building and you don't know what was on the outside of the door, but if you walk in and you look up to the front and there's an altar there, okay? Front and center there's a big altar, you are probably standing in the Catholic Church. Okay? Because everything in the Catholic Church revolves around the altar sacrifice of Jesus. The Eucharist. Okay? And uh, I was an altar boy growing up, and man, I was so nervous when the priest did it at the right time. I had to ring the bell just the exact amount of time with the right intensity, with the right passion, with the right... Just, I was so nervous. And he would hold it up. Everything, everything in the Catholic mass, the whole service, centers around the Eucharist. If you walk in a church building and you don't know what the kind of building it was, you walk in and you see two pulpits, one on either side of the front, 
more than likely you are standing in a Lutheran church. Because everything in a Lutheran church centers around the liturgy. Liturgy, meaning worshipful order. Being in worship, being in, in order. And that's why, much like the Catholic Church, is, which is you know, do in response and do the same thing in you know, a ritual every week, um, it's that routine. The idea is that they can do it together. The liturgy keeps everybody going through this worship experience on Sunday morning together. And they originally they read from this, then they do something else, and they come back and they read from here, and then they go over there, and the pastor will preach from that pulpit. And, and everything is done in order. Everything in the Lutheran church revolves around the liturgy. That's why sometimes you and I as evangelicals, shame on us, we kind of, you know, we kind of poo-hoo and look down, why you gotta read a prayer out of a book? Why you gotta do anything out of a book? You know? Hey, you know something? It's what it's what they do. It's, it's the liturgy. They're all following it and going through it together. Not a bad thing. Only a bad thing, you're not paying attention. Amen? If you walk in the church building, and you walk in, you know what kind of church building it is? You walk in and you see a pulpit in the front and center. You know that you might not know the specific denomination, but you can get guess pretty well. You are standing in an evangelical church. An evangelical. By evangelical, I mean comes from the word evangelist. To evangelize. To preach the message, you must be born again. You must personally decide and give your life to Jesus Christ. You walk in a church building, there's a pulpit front and center. It's because everything in an evangelical church centers around the preaching of the Word of God. Everything centers around the preaching and the emphasis of the Word of God. We believe, as evangelicals, that the preaching of the Word of God is the chief means of grace. The Bible is the inspired Word of God without error. We believe that the Bible is the rule in faith for people's lives. Everything centers around this book. Friends, if you're going to grow and have faith developed, you, we must realize it comes from hearing the Word of God. Amen? Some of you, if I could just give a moment here to slap your hand in a loving way as a father would chastise his children in loving encouragement. Some of you in this room, you've been a Christian for a long time, and you've said to yourself for years, yep, I know it's true, you, you're amen and you're nodding your head, and you're, you're like, yeah, you preach it, Mike. But you're not yet doing it. Can I just ask you, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You need to be disciplined to get up out of the bedside Baptist assembly in the morning Spend time with your Heavenly Father. Spending time in the Word. And friends, don't beat yourself up. You don't need an hour. I mean, if you have an hour, great. You don't need a half hour. Although that'd be great. I'd be thrilled if the majority of you would spend five minutes. Because right now, you tell me it's important, but you don't spend any. You say it's important, but you don't spend any. Five minutes every day, you in the Bible and God alone. Amen? Okay, the third way to make faith grow. You're not going to like this one, by the way. I just tell you. But it's, it's, it's just so true. Some of you older, wiser Christians would be able to attest to the fact that one way that faith grows is through persecution and trials. Persecutions and trials. There is no other way. When you get under the weight of life, you get stronger. If you handle the weight properly. If you don't, it will crush you. Do you get this idea that you're going to live your life? Well, I've given my life to Jesus and everything's going to be wonderful and everything's going to be glorious. In the, in, the end, in the end of all things, after the fat angel sings and we're all gathered up together, yeah, we're going to all say, yeah, and none of it mattered. It was worth it, man. I, I got brought from one degree of glory to another. But in the between time, while we walk this earth, we experience some troubles, some pain, some disappointments, some surprises, things that you never expected. And those trials have a way, if you respond to them properly, make you stronger. You walk out of them with more faith. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, 
The Apostle Paul is writing, he says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. Oh, there we go. Let's tune in. These people's faith is growing more and more. And the love you have for one another is increasing. By the way, I think that's just kind of a natural byproduct. If you're growing in faith this way, you're getting closer to the Father, you have greater love for people. I know that me personally, when I'm not spending this kind of quality time, I get short with people. I get less tolerant of people. I get less forgiving of people. But when I spend time basking in God's presence, I have the patience of Job for people. I have love unspeakable, full of glory for people. In fact, if you ever see me being short or kind of critical and cynical, you should ask me, Pastor Mike, how are your devotions going? Because it's a direct reflection. When I spend time this way, this relationship happens as well. And the love you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast. And this is what he's boasting about. He's boasting about the source of why their faith is growing. We boast about your pers per perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. We're boasting about you because of all the trials and persecutions. And he says, well, we really rejoice because your faith is growing. Well, why is it growing? Because you're going through tough times and you're learning how to lean on him. You know, our, our governor, Jesse Ventura, a few years ago, he says, Christianity is for the weak, those who need a crutch. And some Christians got upset by that. And I'm just like, yeah, that's me. That's me. I need a crutch. Because without that crutch of Jesus, I fall right on my face in sin and depravity. Thanks, I can lean on Him. I can lean on Jesus. He is my hope. He is my help. He is my rescue. He is my salvation. He's my deliverer. He's my bright light shining in the dark and perverse generation. He is the one on whom I lean. You know, I have to admit. It's, it's one thing to talk about how we need to trust God in difficult times. And, but I can tell you this. I, I'm a wimp. I, I've, been, I've never been asked to walk through something terribly, terribly difficult. I mean, quite a few years ago when our son got divorced, God, that was tough. That hurt. I mean, that was, that, I mean it was painful. He wasn't, it just wasn't him getting divorced. I mean, it was painful. But I haven't, like many of you, I haven't had a death of a child. I've buried a lot of children, but not mine. I've buried some of yours. And I've watched you as you go through that. It's, it's incredible. I, I've buried some of your spouses. I've watched you as you go through that. And some of you, as you wrestled through cancer. You know, I remember being there with many of you, holding your hand and praying with you, and wondering, are you going to make it or not? Is this God going to take me home? Is He going to heal me? You don't know. I've learned something interesting about those tough times. You and I, we say what we believe a lot. But it's not until you go through something like that that you get whacked with something like that that you ask yourself questions that you wouldn't dare tell anybody that you're thinking about. Because you say you believe one thing, but when you go through something like that, now you're finding out what you really do believe. And oftentimes, you're a little bit scared by the questions you're asking and the results you're discovering. I've always said I believe this, but now I'm not sure it's true. Is God faithful? Is He going to walk through with me? Can I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fearing no evil because He is with me? Do I really believe that everything that comes into my life has first passed through the hands of our Father? I mean, we say these things, but do we believe them? Trials and persecutions make faith grow strong if you respond properly, which that's another whole message. When we turn to look to Jesus, when we make the choice to say, I know that God is for me. I know that God is good. We are making the right choices. I don't have to understand everything. Friends, let me tell you what. Like I said, I haven't been through a lot of difficulties. But even as I've walked through some of, the, of your difficulties with you, I don't have a lot of answers. 
People say, Pastor Mike, what about that? I go, I wish I had an answer, I don't. But this I do know. In life's most difficult moments, my faith thankfully has only been reduced this far, but it's never been any farther than this. I know two things. Number one, God is good. No matter what happens, I know God is good. Well, why did this happen? Why did this happen? I don't know. But I know God is good. And number two, I know he loves me. I may not know why he allowed your child to go, your spouse, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your... I don't, I don't know. But I do know that God is good. And that he loves me. And that he loves you. In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. It says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that the suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Friends, these, we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? We know they produce hope. Jesus, in, in John chapter 15... And we think that if I'm really loving God, everything's going to go wonderful. No, quite honestly, the opposite is true. The Bible says those that are developing and growing in fruit, He proves so that they can bring more fruit. Quite honestly, when you're experiencing trials and persecutions, it can be a sign not that God has left you, but the exact opposite. That God sees in you incredible, incredible potential. And He wants to develop in you greater and stronger things. So he's allowing the persecution and the trials to bring that pruning in your life. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, I, this, this is great. He, he starts up, count it all joy. Well, that's really hard to do. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials and tribulations. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you realize that trials and persecutions come by, that we can grow in faith, that we are lacking in nothing? That's incredible. Really, we see it as, God, where are you? And God says, I'm right here. Well, God, why? I'm right here. I want you to trust me. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense. You need to trust me. Draw near to me. I remember in a small way illustration of trials and tribulations. Friends, they make us stronger. When I was in, in college, uh, one of the Christian colleges I went to, it was a major denomination uh, name that I, well, I won't mention, but I was at this, they said it was a Christian college. Oh, dear Lord. I had the head of the pastoral studies department and one of my art teachers that would make fun of me in front of class because I was a fundamentalist. I believe the Bible is real, I believe the Bible is for today, and I was sold out to Jesus Christ. I was an alcoholic and drug addict that found Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and madly and deeply in love with him, and they were like, I was just a little too radical for them. Well, all this talk about God, it's, it's a time and a place for that. It's Sunday morning and in church. The head of the pastoral studies department would, would mock me. Ah, this, these fundamentalists, they believe this and they believe that. Mike, you're one of those fundamentalists, aren't you? To a young, 18-year-old, impressionable college kid who's supposed to worship the professors and you're going to test them. And I had one teacher that was sharing the Lord with people in class. And it was our class, so we had the chance to talk. It's not like I was being disruptive. But the teacher in front of the class, once, one time, I remember, I'll never forget, in front of the whole class, says, Hey, Mike, he said, you know, you, you've talk, talked to all of us about Jesus. He said, I suppose you go on the street and tell this to people too, don't you? Like as if that's a bad thing. I'm like, yeah. I, I thought this word says, go ye therefore in all the world. And preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all that I've taught you. It's like, yeah, I do. Friends, you know something? What the enemy meant to destroy and crush in me, did the exact opposite. Those trials, that persecution, forced me to sink my roots down deep. It forced me to analyze, what do I really believe? Am I willing to stand up for what I believe in the most dire circumstances? 
in front of a bunch of classmates in college and the professors up there making what do I believe it makes us stronger I have more faith and I could go on and tell you stories of how God met me one time this Bible this 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 uh, professor um, he was a World War II prisoner of war he typed in Greek the guy was a brainiac and one time he said to me I am going to tell you the story aren't I he said I said my guy he said um, he always made fun of us Pentecostals, the fundamentalists, and you know that kind of thing, and stuff. And he said, "You know, Mike says I, I know that you'd like to talk to me." He says, well, should "Come down to my office next week, you know, at this time and had it scheduled." And I'm thinking, "Well, I really don't want to talk to you. I just disagree with how you tease me and harass me in front of class, you know." Because I'm thinking, I'm a young 18-year-old punk kid. What do I know? How can I debate against a, a professor? of God that he was speechless he didn't he just he was speechless and God whispered in my ear he knows <laughs> thank you thank you you're so faith see that increased my faith my faith grew a little bit that day how does faith grow number one friends it has to be intentional number two it, hearing comes by the word faith grows by faith comes by hearing the word of God. Thirdly, trials and persecution, or persecution and trials. And lastly, with the remaining time, and I'm going to keep you a few minutes over. I let y'all early last week, remember? I'm calling that ship in today. The fourth thing, the way to grow your faith is through discipleship. Discipleship. Um, another word I might want to plug in there is by using it. Another word I might want to use in here is by obedience. Because they all three mean the same thing. Discipleship, or using it, what you've been taught and learned and know to be true. Or obedience. They're all, they're all synonymous. This idea of discipleship. Friends, discipleship, you and I tragically have come to think that discipleship means learning more. Studying more. Knowing more. You come on Sunday morning. You don't come on Sunday morning to be discipled. You come on Sunday morning to learn. What's happening right now is, is teaching, not discipleship. You see, discipleship begins when you leave this room. You get out of these chairs and you go out there. You make a choice. Am I going to be a disciple of Jesus or just somebody who walks around with a lot of knowledge? Am I going to put into practice what I just heard? Week after week, discipleship begins when you leave this building. Discipleship is walking along life and putting into practice the things that you know to be true. It is not amassing more knowledge. Man, I tell you what, in Jesus' day, he was frustrated with the religious leaders, these people who studied the Word of God. They studied the law. In fact, at one place he says, he said, you guys are great. You study the Word thinking that in it you're going to find eternal life. He said, you traverse land and sea to make one convert. And when you do, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Jesus was being a little rough. He said, you're whitewashed uh, sepulchers. You're whitewashed tombs. You look good and white on the outside, all this knowledge. But inside, you're full of dead men's bones. It's not what we know. It's what we're willing to put into practice. And James, it says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only. James 1.22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Philippians chapter 3. This is a great passage. Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It says, all of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. 
I, I love this. That, hey, you know something? Friends, none of us are where we're, at, we're supposed to be yet. We're all going this journey together. And God says, hey, quit judging one another. Take it easy. Hey, if you think God's going to straighten you out, as long as you keep seeking Him, have a passion and want to serve Him, God is going to direct you. And so don't judge me ahead of time. I'm not done. God's not done with me yet. Okay? And He's not done with your neighbors that we have a tendency of wanting to judge all the time. We're all in this thing together. And God's going to be, God is a way of, hey, Brian, pay attention. Hey, Brian. No, no, I don't want you to do that anymore. God is a way of faithfully doing that. Bob? I wasn't talking to you. I was, talk, I was talking to Brian. Now I'm talking to you. God has a way of doing that, too. Man. God has a way of directing us. But then look at verse 16. Verse 16. It says, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Let us live up to what we already have attained. What we've already learned, let's start putting into practice. Let's live up to, let's put into practice those things that we have learned. Let's start doing them. Obedience. Obedience. Some of the guys that were at the men's conference heard me talk about this in the story of Gideon. In Judges chapter 6, you know, they're hiding out from the Midianites, and there's Gideon. He's in a wine press, cramped quarters, grinding out the grain, uh, because for fear if they're out there in the, in the big open expanses, taking care of grain like they used to, uh, the Midianites would see him, and they'd come down and attack, and here he is in this little wine press, grinding out the grain. And verse 12 says, an angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Mighty warrior? He goes on, he says, pardon me, my Lord. Can you reply, but if the Lord is with us, why have all this happened to us? I mean, isn't that the way we are sometimes? Yeah, if God is with us, how come all this? And well, we complain and all that. And Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, getting a reply, and I'm sure he was as polite as he possibly could do, with every ounce of energy he could muster in sincerity. He said, pardon me, my Lord. Um, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. And the Lord answered, and I'm sure with a smile on his face, I'll be with you, and you'll strike down millions, leaving none of them, none of them alive. He smiled and said, you know something? Don't worry about it. If you'll obey me, I'll be with you. I just want you to sign up. Are you willing to do this? And you know the story. Gideon says yes. So then God has a way of always developing and growing faith in us. He asks him to do something. Verse 25. That same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, and one uh, seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it, and then build an altar for me. It's like, oh, wait a minute. You want me to tear down my father's altar? Just tear it down and, and... Are you serious? No, you got to remember, he's preparing him to deliver Israel from the Midianites' hand. And you know what he wants to see? It's, Do you trust me? Are you willing to be obedient? Are you willing to be obedient? You see... If Gideon would not have obeyed that command, I do not believe the rest of the story of Gideon would be in the book. I think there's a lot left to be told, and that's why I talked about if our faith doesn't grow last week, the consequences is missed opportunity. If our faith doesn't grow, if we're not obedient to God and our faith growing, there's things that aren't going to happen. But if we're obedient in the little things, God then entrusts us for bigger things. Why? And we trust Him for bigger things because... I, feed, I, signed, I found him to be faithful. I remember I was 29 years old, pastor for this church. We're building our first building. We're across town. I'm 29 years old. There's, a, you know, about the average attendance was like 250, maybe, maybe get up around that 300, but 250 people. And there's some committed people who believed in me way more than I believed in myself, like, you know, the Fergers and the Morleys and the Andersons. And, and, and we go on. I've, I've used their names again and again. They are so foundational to my life, not only then, but today as well. 
And there'll always be the people in your life if you pay attention. I remember getting alone. I just signed my name because I was the president of the organization as far as the state's concerned. I just signed alone for half a million dollars. Oh, God, it was, it was the hardest thing I did in my life. I was so scared. Dan, I was scared spitless. I was like, oh, man. Fast forward 12 more years. When we came into this building, I signed my name for a loan for two and a half million. And it was easy. You know why it was easy? My faith had grown. That what God started in the beginning, He continued to develop. What once was difficult, now, manifold more times, is easy. We read the story of Gideon. He, go, he says he... Um, Tear down the Father's altar to ball and cut down the Asher pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God in the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asher pole that you just cut down. Offer the second bull as an offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. I, I love this stuff. Friends. you got to read the rest of the story. He did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night. That's what he did. <laughs> I love that. I love that, because here's the deal. We all do things. When God asks you to do them, something, we usually do it afraid. 500, a half a million dollars to sign my name to. I did it afraid. Later, Gideon's going to go into battle facing the armies of Midian. And guess what? He's got all the faith and confidence in the world, confidence in the world because he knows and he has believed. He knows it. Faith grows through discipleship or using it or obedience. Whatever those things that you want to use. Let those words describe that what I'm trying to get across. Guys, I'd like to challenge you. For 30 days, try to listen to the voice of God and do whatever He tells you. For 30 days, I'd like to put a challenge to you and confront you either when you're reading the Word, because this is God's Word, the Logos, and the Rhema, when God speaks to you, God's Word. If God speaks to you in your heart, and in your spirit, He speaks something to you, I want you to obey it. It may be difficult. You're going to have a tendency to want to argue with God. That's too much money. That, I can't write a check off of that much. If God is saying it, do it. Oh, God, I, I can't teach the fifth graders. I'm in fear of my life of fifth graders. <laughs> Those boys are going to kill me. No. I want you to go build a deck for your neighbor. God, I, I, can't, I can't do that. Friends, whatever it is, when you sense, if you sense in the next 30 days, God asking you to do something, it may sound crazy. It might be ridiculous. It, here's the thing. If you need to check it out with your, a trusted Christian friend, do, do that. That's a good thing. Ask him. Say, hey, you know, I, I really believe the Lord is saying this and that. You know, if, if it's something like this seems so crazy or out of it will never be out of the will of God. Out of the, out of the, it may seem out of your natural understanding. But if it's not immoral, illegal, or, or um, unscriptural, go for it. Then go for it. Trust him. God is trying to grow your faith. He's going to develop some things in your life. Some neat, I can only imagine, some of the neat things that can take place if you will trust God and His Word. In the next 30 days, what He says to you, obey. Oh man, I, I think we're going to see some incredible things. Because I realize and I believe that in this particular congregation, the majority of you, I can sense your spirit saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to trust God. Whatever God says in the next 30 days, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to try this out. And God is telling you some things. I'll tell you this right now. God is telling some of you some things. Only because He has greater and bigger things. He wants to know, can He trust you? Will you obey Him? Let me tell you a quick story. Okay, it's already 10 after. Has anybody got to go? You got to roast in the oven or something? Um, let me tell you a story. And then with this, I'm going to be done. We won't. You guys can relax. You guys can relax. Just, just, just relax. 
Um, I talked to you about this, this culvert thing we put in um, just yesterday. It started several months ago, to be quite honest. Um, there's, a, there's a lady in, uh, I was driving, I was driving, you know, by, on the way to work. There was this one house, it's a small little house, in this driveway, and it's just bad and nasty in the yard, floods. And whoever lives there has to drive through, I'm, at times, almost two feet of water after rain or in the spring, that kind of thing. It's just horrible. And I kind of sensed God to any prompting, and that, you know, the men's ministry is, we should just, in an act of love and genuine, unique kindness, we should just, we should just fix it. Okay, and I, and I thought I was just kind of rolling around, and I was thinking, hey, this, I think it's sense from God. Well, then I met this atheist lady. She walks around our neighborhood a lot. And she's a lovely lady. I love her. She's a, a professed atheist. And so every once in a while I talk to her about praying. She goes, yeah, I'm like, you do whatever you want to do. Um, what's really funny is she likes me. <laughs> she even said to me, she says, I don't know why, but I like you. <laughs> I think what she was saying is, I don't think I'm supposed to because you're a pastor and I'm an atheist, but I really like you. You just have a zest for life and there's something about you. So it's really cool. I feel like I got a little change in my pocket going jingling a um, <laughs> So... So when, when this conversation was going on and I found she was this, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I wonder if she lives there. And this is God's way of just showing kindness and, and just what a blessing to her. And so a couple weeks more go by and I, I finally, the next time I see her, I ask her, I said, I said, you know, Venus, where do you live? She tells me her name is Venus. Her initials, she boasted and tell me my initials are VD. She's a sweet lady. I'm, I'm keen to kind of brash here because she is, and she's, that's just the way she is. She's 80 years old. She's a sweetheart. I really like her. Um, so I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I, I think that's where she lives. So I asked her one day, I said, so Venus, where do you live? And she points that direction when I was hoping she was pointing towards that house. And she pointed out, I live over. I'm like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. Right away, I started cooling on the idea of having to do the driveway. Because in my mind, it made perfect sense. God was saying, Mike, I want you to do the driveway. Come to find out, this lady lives there. And it was going to be a witness and, and an example of just God's generosity and kindness. And it made perfect sense to me. But now when she said she lives over there and not there, I kind of cooled on the idea of having to do the driveway because I thought it was really for her anyway. And I just kind of sat on it for a few more weeks. A few more weeks go by. I'm driving by one day and I hear the Lord kind of prompt me again. Mike, are you going to fix that driveway? Now, to be honest, I said, well, why? I don't live in Lizzie. I'm just being really honest. The point, the point is, I asked you to fix that driveway. So, a couple more weeks go by, and I bump into Venus again, and I, I told her, I said, you know, Venus, I said, if I just show, I show her what I want to do, I didn't say God put it on my heart to freak her out, but I said, what? what me and some of my friends from church want to do is we want to fix that lady's driveway. If I just show up and knock on her door and say, hi, because she doesn't know who I am or anything, if I just show up and say, we want to fix your driveway, she'd go, yeah, right. What do you want? You know, what that whole deal. So I said, do you know the lady who lives in and described that house where it was? She says, oh, I know who that is. I said, well, you know me and you can trust that I don't really want anything, not even a thank you. She doesn't got to wave at me when I go by because I never see her there anyway. I don't know even who, I didn't have a clue who lives there. I said, could you let them know what I'd like to do? And then if they're interested, get my number. And she said, okay, I'll do that. So make a long story short, a couple days later, this lady, the owner of the house, calls me. And I tell her who I am. I didn't say Pastor Mike. I just said, yeah, yeah, Mike is the And, and, um, and I, I just really like to. She said, well, why would you want to do that? I said, just because. Just because. Um, I see you driving, and I just want, I just want to get, get a fix. That's all. No, don't want anything for it. Don't want even to thank you. Okay, so now I'm on. We're, we're locked in. We're going to do this thing. Literally, it was two days ago, I bumped into Venus on my motorcycle coming down the road, and um, she was yelling at me. <laughs> because I told her, you know, I talk about how fast I ride, and I don't have a helmet. And I tell her I'm riding on the freeway for a long time. I, you know, dance 80 miles an hour, put the cruise control on. I got my hands off my bars. And, I'm, and she's, Mike, knock that off. Don't you do that. Don't, what? Are you in a hurry to get to that heaven you believe in? And I go, well, no, I'm not in a hurry. I'm just trying to enjoy life. But when I go there, I will be ready. And, you know, I told her I said side saddle sometimes. And she's, oh, Mike, I don't want to hear that. Because she likes me. 
So I tell her, I said, you know, I said, we're, we're geared up. We're going to go fix that driveway and we're going to... And she said to me, she said, that's unbelievable. She said, maybe it's because I'm, I'm she's 80 years old, by the way. Um, she said, maybe it's, as I've gotten older, I'm more cynical, but nobody does that today. There's always what's in for them. She said, I just can't believe that. Why, why are you going to do that? I said, just because God is good. Oh, yeah, I got that. It's really interesting. Friends. Here's the thing that I learned from the situation. When God asks us to do something, real often, if we can justify it, and if it makes sense to us, we go, oh, yeah, okay. You see, when God said, I want you to fix that driveway, and I thought it was for her, that made perfect sense. But when I found out she didn't live there, now all of a sudden, it didn't make sense. I was like, well, why do I, it, it just, it didn't make sense to me now. And, but then God backed at, God got back after me and said, hey, Mike, didn't I ask you to fix that driveway? See, we don't have to figure it out, we just got to be obedient. Because here's the thing I learned, full circle. Yeah, we did it for her, the driveway, but it was still for her. The witness was still for Venus, even though she didn't live there. The lady who lives there, she just she came out yesterday morning. She had to go to work, so we're out there and all that. She just she just can't believe. It. She said, "I can't believe why would you, why would you?" I said, "Just because." It's so cool. We're going to finish it up this Saturday. We're going to buy some really expensive topping rock because we, we spent already about, I don't know, 600 bucks just in fill to get ready, prepared, nice stuff. We're going to do this nice. And then we're going to spend another few hundred dollars with the crushed uh, stuff that compacts. It's really nice and hard. We're going to put that on there this Saturday. Um, this is so cool. A random act of kindness. Do you know it really was? This is being obedient to what God's asked us to do. For the next 30 days, not that I, I don't want to show hands, but I want to ask you the question. Again, don't raise your hands. But would you be willing to say, God, in the next 30 days, I will do whatever you ask. Please make your voice clear. Help me. Because I believe God wants to do some incredible things. God wants to see our faith grow. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, as we are dismissed from this place, I pray that you'd help us to truly latch on to the idea that spiritual growth, growing our faith, is intentional. It comes by hearing the word, both written and you speak it to our hearts and our spirits. It comes through perse perseverance, I mean, persecutions and trials. And it comes through obedience. But you ask us for little things so that you can trust us with bigger things. Fathers, we are dismissed from this place. I pray that you would never dismiss us from your presence. And may our faith continue to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If you got some time and you're interested in joining Ron with some splitting wood, see him on the lobby for Ron. Bless you.